I'm Sister Vasa, and I'm having my coffee right now before going to work here in Vienna, in Austria. It's the second week of November right now, and it's actually been a very rainy November here in Vienna. I always used to love November, but we've just been flooded with rain this year. This week, we received a special email with an uncommon request from a viewer named Angelina in California. At first I thought, what kind of a name is Angelina? And then I remembered that there is a Serbian saint named Angelina, so I'm presuming our viewer from California is Serbian Orthodox. Anyway, she writes, Dear Sister Vasa, the kids and I love your show. She writes love in caps. Since two of my kids are, were born in Africa, could you please do more episodes on saints from the African continent? Thanks, and Brad says hi. Brad is probably one of her children. Hello, little Brad. Anyway, thanks to our viewers in California for their uncommon request. And since we happen to have a saint from the African continent, Saint John the Merciful, Pope or Patriarch of Alexandria. Alexandria is in Egypt, in case you didn't know. And this saint is celebrated on November 12th. We will be reflecting on his life, Saint John the Merciful, in our show today. Saint John the Merciful was born in the mid 6th century on the southern coast of Cyprus at Amethyst, the ruins of which are now approximately six miles east of Limassol. When St. John was a child, he had a vision of a beautiful maiden with an olive wreath on her head who said her name is Compassion or Mercy. This vision made such a deep impression on him that from then on he strove to be compassionate to others, especially to the needy. St. John was married and even had children, but his wife and children died and he entered the monastic life. We do not know exactly where he entered the monastic life, but we do know that he became so well known for his exemplary ascetical life that the Byzantine Emperor Phocas appointed him Patriarch or Pope of Alexandria. You see, the bishops of Alexandria are also called popes, in case you didn't know. One of the first things that St. John did as Bishop of Alexandria was to make a list of thousands of poor people in Alexandria and took them under his especial care. In fact, he devoted the larger part of the revenues of his see to the care of the needy. He freed many slaves and he visited the hospitals three times a week. He also did much to fight corruption in Alexandria and to improve the system of weights and measures in the marketplace, which previously had been very unfair to the poor. St. John was also involved in battling the heresy of monothelitism, the early stages of that heresy anyway. And before you turn the video off or go to sleep, I think I should tell you a few words about monothelitism because it's actually very important. Monothelitism is a view that troubled the Christian East in the 7th century, largely thanks to the Patriarch of Constantinople, Sergius, and to the Byzantine Emperor, Heraclius. Monothelitism is the view that in Jesus Christ there are two natures, but only one divine will. This view was finally denounced by the Sixth Ecumenical Council of 680-681 in Constantinople. This council proclaimed that there is both a human will and a divine will in Christ, as well as two energies, and that Christ's human will, importantly, is not merely a passive instrument in the hands of the divine. Now, why should we care about this theological concept? Because, this means that our human will plays an active role, not a passive one, in our journey to God. 
You see, everything we understand about the God-man or Jesus Christ has consequences about the way we understand our own relationship of our humanity with God, with the divine. Because we take on Christ in baptism and he has taken on our nature in the incarnation. In other words, we share a common humanity. The fact that our human will plays an active role in our journey to God means that we don't simply sit around and wait for our human will to somehow be swallowed up by God's will. No, through communion with God, we eventually bring our will into harmony with God's will, more precisely into synergy with his will. But that's enough dogmatic theology for now. Now, those of you still with us, please wake up and let's get back to the saint. As Bishop of Alexandria, St. John the Merciful also built many churches, increasing the number of churches in Alexandria from 7 to 70. In fact, he was so generous that he sometimes seemed not very practical about issues of money. It happened, for example, once when the crowds were gathering in front of his residence to receive a handout, there were also well-dressed young women in this crowd. The stewards of the bishop warned him that these young women didn't really need a handout, and St. John replied, Give them what they're asking for, because the Lord did not tell us that we should investigate the lives of those who ask us for help. St. John had to flee the city of Alexandria in around the year 619 because of the occupation of the Sassanid Persians of Alexandria. He died in his native Cyprus soon after that, around the year 619. His body now lies in St. Martin's Cathedral in Bratislava, Slovakia. St. John is known as the Merciful, so let's reflect a bit more on the virtue called mercy and also on its impractical, awkward sides. First of all, note that what we call mercy in English is a not completely accurate translation of the Greek word eleos, which means much more than merely the external action of withholding punishment. The Greek eleos signalizes a state of heart overflowing with compassion, generosity, and kindness. Jesus Christ often emphasizes the importance of this internal reality as opposed to the merely hypocritical external piety as that displayed by the Pharisees when he repeatedly quotes the biblical phrase, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is dining in the home of Matthew together with sinners and the Pharisees are scandalized by this indeed embarrassing behavior of Jesus, he says to them, go and learn what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And think of another embarrassing situation in which Jesus finds himself when he allows a woman to anoint him with extravagantly expensive perfume in the house of a leper in Bethany, to the chagrin even of his own disciples. He says to them, leave her alone, she has done what she could. In all these cases, Jesus values the internal disposition of people over their external propriety or even practicality. You see, the sinners of the gospel have an appropriate state of mind more often than the religious establishment of that time. This is why Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, because his call can only be heard by those who have a heart aware of the awkward fact that it is in fact a sinner, and hence capable of mercy. Well, that's our thought for the day and our Saint of the Week, Saint John the Merciful, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>